Imagine being 14, skipping school and heading off to a big city without telling anyone back at home. That's exactly what Andrew Gosden did on a typical September day in 2007. He left his home in Doncaster, South Yorkshire, withdrew £200 from his bank account, and bought a one-way ticket to London. Andrew was last seen on CCTV at King's Cross Station, and then he simply vanished. What happened next is a mystery that has puzzled everyone ever since. Why would a young teenager take off to London alone? Was he planning to meet someone? Did he know what he was getting into? The possibilities are endless, and the details are just as shocking. Join us as we explore the timeline of Andrew's disappearance, the many theories that emerged, and try to piece together what might have happened to him. Andrew Gosden was born on July 10, 1993, in Balby, a suburb of Doncaster, South Yorkshire. He lived with his parents, Kevin and Glenis Gosden, and his sister, Charlotte. The Gosden family, though Anglican, chose not to baptize their children, preferring to let them explore their own beliefs and interests. Andrew was an exceptional student at Macaulay Catholic High School. He had a perfect attendance record and was part of the Young, Gifted and Talented program aimed at the top 5% of students. His teachers expected him to achieve straight A's in his GCSE exams, and he was even described as a prize-winning mathematician with the potential for Cambridge. Despite this, Andrew didn't seem particularly excited about school, often saying he found it easy and hoped for more challenges. In the summer of 2006, Andrew attended a two-week residential program at Lancaster University for gifted students. He came back enthusiastic and full of stories about his experience. Though he was quiet and preferred his own company, Andrew wasn't a loner. He had a small group of friends at school, but didn't socialize with them outside of school hours. His family noted that he showed no signs of depression or bullying, and he generally seemed content. Speaking of which, Andrew had some unique characteristics. He was absent-minded and not very streetwise, which made him potentially vulnerable. Despite being 14, he looked younger, more like a 12-year-old, because of his small stature. He wore strong prescription glasses, was deaf in one ear, and had a distinctive double ridge on his right ear. Andrew also had light brown hair, which he planned to dye black before he disappeared. He had owned a few mobile phones but rarely used them, and had recently lost his latest one, choosing not to replace it. Instead, he asked for an Xbox. This goes to show that Andrew loved video games and was a fan of metal bands. The events leading up to his disappearance are as puzzling as they are ordinary. During the 2007 summer holidays, Andrew's parents suggested he visit his grandmother in London, but he declined. Just eight days into the new school year, on September 14th, Andrew did something out of character. He walked home from school instead of taking the bus, which was a four-mile journey. He repeated this the next day. The night before his disappearance seemed completely normal. The family had dinner together, Andrew worked on a computer puzzle with his dad, and then watched some comedy shows with his mom. The next morning, September 14th, 2007, Andrew had trouble waking up and was unusually irritable. At 8.05 a.m., he left the house, seen walking through Westfield Park by a family friend. But instead of heading to school, Andrew walked to a nearby ATM and withdrew £200. Although he had 214 in his account, the ATM only allowed withdrawals in increments of £20. This restriction meant he could only take out £200, even though he had a bit more available. It's unclear why he withdrew this amount, but it was the maximum he could take out at that moment. He then returned home, changed out of his school uniform into casual clothes, specifically a black slipknot t-shirt, black jeans, trainers, a watch on his left wrist, and carried a black canvas satchel adorned with patches of rock and metal bands. 
and so he left for Doncaster railway station, taking just his wallet, keys, and his PlayStation Portable, PSP. He also left £100 in cash that he had saved from his birthday celebration. He took his satchel and walked to Doncaster railway station, where he bought a one-way ticket to London for £31.40. Despite the ticket seller suggesting a return ticket was just 50p more. A woman on the train noticed Andrew was quiet, engrossed in a video game. Andrew arrived at King's Cross Station at 11.20am and was seen on CCTV leaving the station at 11.25am. That was the last confirmed sighting of him. His school tried to contact his parents when he didn't show up for morning classes, but they mistakenly called the wrong number and left a message with another family. By the time his parents realized he was missing, the important hours had already passed. That evening, the Gosden family sat down for dinner, thinking Andrew was either in the converted cellar playing video games or in his room doing homework. However, when they discovered he wasn't in the house, they initially thought he might be with a friend or neighbor and had lost track of time. The parents called Andrew's friends, only to find out he hadn't been to school that day. Around 7 p.m., they contacted the police. Andrew's sister, Charlotte, recalled the panic that set in when they realized he never even attempted to go to school. Charlotte and their father, Kevin, searched the route to school and the nearby areas, but found nothing. Within three hours of discovering Andrew was missing, a missing person leaflet was produced and distributed. The family and friends continued their search until nightfall. That weekend, the police searched the bushes near the Gosden's home in Doncaster, but found no trace of Andrew. Three days later, after speaking to the ticket seller who sold Andrew his train ticket, the police confirmed he had travelled to London. The ticket seller remembered Andrew because he declined a return ticket, even though it was only slightly more expensive than a one-way ticket. Kevin later mentioned that Andrew not buying a return ticket didn't seem odd, since Andrew knew people in London he could stay with. Initial searches in London focused on areas like Chislehurst and Sidcup, where the Gosden family had relatives. Days after the disappearance, the family went to London, handing out flyers and posters around places Andrew might visit, such as museums and exhibitions. The South Yorkshire Police asked the British Transport Police to review CCTV footage within two days of Andrew going missing, but they couldn't pick him out from the crowds. Three weeks later, after reviewing the footage again, they identified Andrew leaving the main concourse at King's Cross. This CCTV image, along with a close-up of Andrew's distinctive double-ridged right ear, was circulated in the media. A year after Andrew's disappearance, the head teacher at his school travelled to London with staff and students to distribute 15,000 leaflets. The Gosden family expressed frustration with the police's focus on investigating the family rather than expanding the search beyond King's Cross. Kevin Gosden felt the police viewed him as a suspect initially, and he described the interviews as unlawfully recorded attempts to pressure him into revealing information. Eventually, Kevin and the rest of the family were cleared of any involvement. No one knew where Andrew was, and the focus then shifted to knowing whether he was even alive. But then, on the first anniversary of Andrew's disappearance, there were 122 reported sightings from all over Britain, including 45 from London and 11 from Brighton. Kevin mentioned that a few sightings in the first week seemed credible, mainly because of how witnesses described Andrew speaking to them. The family believed the most plausible sighting was at a pizza hut on Oxford Street, not far from King's Cross. However, they claimed that the police never investigated this lead. Additional unconfirmed sightings were reported on Oxford Street a few days after Andrew went missing, and another reported sighting placed him sleeping in a park in Southwark. On September 19, 2007, five days after his disappearance, Andrew was reportedly seen getting off a local train from Waterloo at Mort Lake Station. He was then possibly seen walking up Sheen Lane and along Upper Richmond Road. On that day, 
It was reported that he appeared to have obtained warmer clothes. Then, a month after his disappearance, a woman reported seeing a boy matching Andrew's description in Covent Garden. When she approached him thinking he was the missing boy, he denied being Andrew. None of these sightings led to any significance. Kevin Gosden expressed disappointment that the police did not follow up on these leads more promptly, noting that the woman who reported the Covent Garden sighting wasn't contacted until six weeks after the event. And so, in May 2011, the family hired a private company to conduct a sonar search of the River Thames, using technology often used to locate objects and victims at sea. Although they did not find any trace of Andrew, the search did uncover another body. Then in December 2021, following an anonymous tip-off, two men were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and human trafficking. One of the men was also linked to possession of indecent images of children. Both men were released under investigation, with their devices seized for forensic examination. In January 2023, the police announced that the men were still under investigation, but by September 2023, both had been released without charge and were not considered involved in Andrew's disappearance. All this leaves us thinking, why did he go to London? Was he planning to meet someone? Did he intend to start a new life? Was it all planned out? Let's have a look at the theories. One of the first theories considered by Andrew's family was that he might have gone to London for sightseeing. Andrew loved visiting the city, especially its museums and exhibitions. The idea seemed plausible because his family often travelled there to see relatives. It was easy to get around since bus travel was free for kids back then. His sister had even gone to London at 14 to hand out CVs for work experience, so they thought Andrew might have been doing something similar. However, there was no solid evidence to support this idea. Another theory was that Andrew might have gone to London for a concert. On the night he disappeared, two bands, 30 Seconds to Mars and Sixth, were performing. The Sixth concert was especially notable because it was a farewell show with the original vocalist, making it a unique event. Although Andrew liked similar metal bands, there was no proof he attended these concerts. Mick Neville, a retired head of the Metropolitan Police's Central Images Unit, found the sixth theory plausible and even called for photos and videos from the gig to be analysed by super recognisers. Despite the effort, nothing conclusive came from it. A third theory involved a Finnish band called Him. They had a promotional event at an HMV store on Oxford Street on Monday, 17th of September 2007, followed by an exclusive concert. Entry to this event was only possible through contests and giveaways. The family, with help from him, investigated this lead but found no significant clues. The police and family considered the possibility that Andrew might have gone to London to meet someone he had met online. However, there was no evidence to support this theory. Andrew didn't use a computer at home, didn't have an email address, and had not set up online accounts on his Xbox or PSP. The police took computers from Andrew's school and Doncaster Library but found no trace of him using them. Sony, the company that made Andrew's PSP, confirmed there was no record of him setting up an account or communicating through the device. His sister's laptop the only computer in the house, had only been in her possession for eight weeks, and she said Andrew wasn't interested in social media or online interactions. Kevin Gosden, Andrew's father, speculated that Andrew might have wanted to reinvent himself, possibly inspired by the story of Reginald Perrin, a character who faked his death to start anew. Kevin also wondered if Andrew was struggling with something he felt he couldn't share, like his sexual orientation. The family was open and accepting, but they considered the possibility that Andrew might have found it difficult to discuss such personal issues. In 2009, they appealed to the gay community for help, expressing unconditional love and support for Andrew 
regardless of his sexual orientation. Andrew's father speculated that maybe Andrew went to London to do something he felt was easier to ask forgiveness for than permission, but again, there was no evidence to back this up. In June 2018, a new lead surfaced involving an online conversation with a user named Andy Rue. This person claimed their boyfriend had left them and they needed £200 to cover rent. When someone offered to help, the user mentioned they didn't have a bank account because they had left home when they were 14. This detail caught the attention of the Gosden family and investigators as it closely matched Andrew's age when he disappeared. The police investigated this lead but couldn't identify the person behind the username. This theory suggests that Andrew might have been using the Andy Rue identity and was in need of financial assistance. However, there's probably more than one person who has left home at 14, and it could very well be a coincidence. There is, of course, also the possibility that he chose to end his own life. He was a very smart but a little different boy in his most vulnerable age. It could well have been that he went to London to do his favourite stuff one last time. As one Redditor puts it, I think he's only bringing some of his money, no charger for his device and breaking a perfect attendance record, were psychological incentives to go through with it. This could very well be what happened, but if we have to choose, we'll go for another theory that sits more right with us. Based on the various clues and theories surrounding Andrew's disappearance, let's piece together what we think most likely happened. We know that Andrew was a bright and thoughtful young man, so any explanation for his actions must consider both his intelligence and his apparent secrecy on the day he left. First and foremost, we believe it's likely that Andrew is no longer alive and that foul play was involved. He had a seemingly normal relationship with his family, and it just seems too weird that he would stay out of touch for all these years, especially when so many people have been looking for him. The fact that the police arrested two guys connected to Andrew's case suggests that they too believe that someone did something to him, or at least that someone knows something. One possible scenario is that he went alone to a show, somehow got lost, met the wrong people, got robbed, and things went out of hand. But it is very unlikely that there would be no witnesses to such a scenario, which would have been completely random. Due to its randomness, it's highly unlikely that he wouldn't have been found by now, since disposing of someone normally takes some planning. The fact that no traces of Andrew was ever found on any of the venues, plus the whole thing with the one-way train ticket, also makes us think he was meeting someone elsewhere and that he probably didn't know how long he would stay. You know how at 14, when teenagers start to believe they're mature enough to handle anything and everything on their own, thinking they can make all the right decisions for themselves? Well, Andrew was probably no different. It's almost certain that his family didn't know everything about his life on the internet, and we think he was going to meet someone he'd met online who'd probably told him to not say anything to anyone. This online, quote, friend, unquote, was not who he said he was. We've mentioned that Kevin Gosden, Andrew's father, appealed to the LGBTQ community in 2009 for information about his son. This suggests that the family had some reason to believe that Andrew might have been struggling with his sexual orientation and seeking a place where he could explore this aspect of his identity freely. Despite being an open-minded family, Andrew might have felt unable to discuss such personal matters at home. It could well be, at the time of his sudden disappearance, Andrew was struggling with his sexual identity and that's when he made an online connection with someone who offered help or comfort. This person might have provided the sense of belonging and understanding that Andrew felt he lacked at home. London, with its diverse and accepting communities, would have seemed like an ideal destination for this exploration. If what happened next was an accident or an event of more sinister nature, it is impossible to say. 
But due to the complete lack of information on his whereabouts after that infamous CCTV recording at King's Cross, we believe that the person or persons who met Andrew had planned something that ended in the worst possible way. Now let's hear from you. What did we miss? Do you agree with our theory or do you have your own detective insights to share? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you love our content and want to support our channel, do check out our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.